what it is guys it's AK Rex here uh, welcome to my channel I'm here with the very exciting uh, news I've brought a special guest again and uh, today we're going to be doing an interview it's a multi-part interview so this is part one of it and uh, once this is finished stay tuned for the next parts they will be coming out as I edit the footage so Let's welcome our guest. Uh, hello, what is your name? And please introduce yourself and uh, tell us who you are and where you're from. <laughs> ow, ow. I am... A, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I promised you at least so many amount of minutes of full Malcolm. So I, I, I'm going to bring the Malcolm as much as I can. Um, <laughs> but now, yes, this is uh, Joshua Valse. And um, I'm an amateur paleontologist and a paleo artist, and I'm a Hollywood effects artist here in California. Awesome, awesome stuff. So um, let's uh, just uh, tackle the um, uh, questions and just brief points that we have uh, outlined, and uh, we'll just uh, go along as we speak, and if needs be, we will see what else our view viewers can benefit from. Does that sound good? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Awesome. <laughs> so, um, well, how did you get into paleontology, dinosaurs, and paleo art, and just all of this lovely, jubbly, prehistoric stuff? Yeah, no, um, my, my interest in paleontology stems from uh, movies, which I think a lot of paleontologists originated from movies as as they were kids um, films like Godzilla and King Kong and the Ray Harryhausen films uh, my father uh, raised me on those and then I had a very adventurous lifestyle so if you can imagine um, Indiana Jones and his dad's relationship at the end of the last crusade uh, that was very much me and my father he would take me out in the wild and uh, we would be catching snakes and heal monsters and then as I got older, uh, my father started doing genealogy, and this became a segue into archaeology. Uh, so I was actually more of an archaeologist before I was an amateur paleontologist, uh, because we would go out to Arizona and we would do uh, archaeological uh, excavations with the local uh, archaeologists in the museums. Uh, yeah, we would, we would be hunting down petroglyphs and Indian burial sites, and we actually have been on an ongoing conservationist program to save a giant uh, a grave site, a mass grave site. So it's it's been it's been quite a journey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then um, uh, in the middle of one of those excavations, um, I um, we were going through a squatter town. And for people who don't know who squatters are, squatters are people that kind of live out of their car and you find them in the desert and they basically squat down in an area and either sell things or kind of live there for a, an elongated amount of time. And these guys had like a little uh, tourist attraction and they were selling fossils. And I just so happened to pick up a couple of fossils and that kind of became an excuse to start uh, revisiting my passion for paleontology. And as it went down the road, I ended up picking up some very large, uh, significant specimens that because I had uh, studied it enough, I could see what it was in terms of its value. So, for example, we found or I found sitting on a table in the middle of the desert uh, getting the wind kicked into it, a endocast of a fossil brain. And that became an excuse for me to contact the Vert Paleo Department here in L.A. at the Natural History Museum. And uh, the guy I contacted was Hal Thomas, and Hal, who, who is retired, um, he invited me over, and we spent a whole afternoon in the Vert Paleo Department with the rest of the paleontologists just, just looking at fossil brains. Um, and then and there was another instance where I found a, a croc skull, and there's a lot of fake fossils out there. Most of them are crocodilian skulls, but I, I think we had the photo of that, and that was a legit croc skull that came out, and that got me into the Dino Institute talking with um, uh, Doug Goudreau, who is actively at the Dinosaur Institute. So me and Doug were be behind the glass that you see 
at the Natural History Museum. And this was kind of the repetitive process for a while until finally I made uh, contacts with the, uh, the La Brea Tar Pits. And uh, me and the Tar Pits, uh, through uh, a few contacts, including Trevor Valley, uh, started working more and more together. And then I became kind of a field paleontologist freelancer. So they were the I was the guy that they would send out to other sites to kind of consolidate how big of a site it was, how small of a site it was. And this kind of led to uh, an ongoing experience of mammoth hunting here in uh, California. So that that's kind of the, the condensed version of the long history that got me into paleontology. <laughs> Fair enough. That sounds like a very exciting and interesting story indeed. And uh, it, uh, it seems like uh, your interest still pursuing, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> Active. Good. Good stuff, good stuff. So, uh, well, uh, why don't we uh, break it down a little bit? So, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the process of fossil hunting prep and preparation and relevant experiences? Maybe some of the particularly interesting examples? Just anything that comes to mind? Yeah, yeah. Um, we talked a little bit about the fossil brain. Uh, the fossil brain is probably still the most significant find that I've found just sitting out in the middle of nowhere at, at like a curiosity booth with out of, out of a squatter town in the middle of a desert. And um, uh, these fossils, we I personally bring them to the museum, uh, which we kind of encourage a lot of people that are trying to aspire into uh, paleontology and amateur paleontologists to bring your samples to the museum um, because a lot of these samples are sadly lost to the private market uh, via sold under the table or uh, even through eBay. You'll find fossils on sale through eBay of all places. And I've, I've saved fossils from eBay that <laughs> have been used uh, for our re-educational programs uh, through the um, through the Jurassicon organization. But um, yeah, no, the, the fossil brain was fun. Uh, we, we took that, and, and it's funny because I found it and when you turned the brain, the endocast, and the endocast belonged to an oreodont, uh, which is a very common fossil that you find out in uh, mainly, I think it's uh, Wyoming and, and Nevada, a lot of the, uh, I think it's the Green River Formation out there. And they, um, they kind of looked at the condition of the skull. And they just started digging away at the skull or at the matrix, trying to find more and more skull. And there was a section that the the actual cranium had flaked away, but it left inside of the matrix a positive impression of the brain. And if you study fossil brains long enough, you'll start you'll you'll be able to see the shape of it like, oh no, that's the shape of a brain. But the guy that was prepping this, who's just a random uh, rock hound, didn't know that. So he actually started carving away at the endocast. He started to scrape away the brain and trying to find more of the fossil. So I quickly took this from him <laughs> and I asked him, hey, how much is this? And he gave me this ballpark price because it was a very damaged skull, but he did not realize the value of the actual endocast itself. So he's like, oh, X amount of dollars. And I, I literally picked it in my pocket and I was like, here, let me take this from you. Let me save this from you, you madman. And I ushered it away home back in LA. And then I started making phone calls and Hal Thomas was the one that called me. And then the next morning we were at the Natural History Museum in LA in the Vert Paleo Department discussing fossil brains. And uh, at the time, they were actually, I think, in the middle of writing an abstract or discussing at SVP that year or the year before, someone had discovered a crystal brain from a whale. And the story, the story is just as horrible. They found this rock being used as a footstop at somebody's door. So someone was just using this crystal brain as a footstop to keep the door from swinging open, not knowing it was a crystal brain. So they, so they recovered the brain. <laughs> and then what really cemented the fact that it was the brain, they actually had a part of the cranial process that the brain fit into. So this was presented at SVP. 
um, everybody kind of was like, oh, yes, let's save the brain. And Hal had one of these brains. I think there's more than one of these crystal brains out there. And he had one of them there at the department. So I have my endocast of my Oreodont brain. He has his crystal brain from a whale. And we just spent the whole day just comparing brains. It, it was a really great day. So that, that's just one story. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the first one. Um, uh, are, are there more? Oh, yeah, there's tons. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, one of the first fossils that I was able to save was a uh, titanothere jaw. And um, that's that's one of the other images that I showed you of it. The, it's basically it was broken in a million pieces. The guy just kept slugging it around in a, a, a cardboard box of just uh, gravel. And he had it, again, out in the sun. And I looked over it, and it was it was in very bad shape. But it was one of the first large fossils that I ever consolidated and started piecing back together. So it was kind of like a good beginner's jigsaw puzzle for piecing fossils back together in general. And uh, we it, it took a while to get all the pieces. And not only were was this giant jaw in pieces, uh, they kind of lacquered this very bad. Um, type of resin over it that because it was out in the sun just kind of flaked so i then had to spend not only time piecing all of these fragments together but also peeling off the resin from the surface of of the jaw so it, it turned into a quite a, a a very large process um and then eventually i got um i pieced it all together and i ended up with a jaw that it was a fragment of a jaw the back end of the jaw of the man uh, of the mandible and the joint was missing uh but we had the m1 i think part of the m2 molar uh the front end of the jaw that was kind of disarticulated in another section and all together it was a good like maybe two foot chunk of jaw so i took this in uh, which was another introduction into vert paleo, uh, the vert paleo department at NHM. And I think this was the fossil that I took to the tar pits that kind of cemented me as kind of a um, kind of a contractor with the tar pits, an unofficial contractor with the tar pits, which that later on is what got me to this giant mammoth site up north in uh, northern California. Uh, but yeah, that, that titanothere jaw was was quite a project. And we have photos of comparing that jaw process to uh, one of the casts of a brawn tops that they had at the Natural History Museum. Um, and then we couldn't cart it to their megacerops specimen because that specimen's on display at their mantle hall. Uh, but we were able to compare it and we were like, yeah, this is a significantly bigger jaw. Uh, so that, that was another fun uh, project that we ended up doing. <laughs> so. That's nice, nice stuff. Um, so, uh, well, yeah, that's uh, very interesting. What can we say? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, do you uh, attend SVP meetings often? Um, sadly, no, no. Um, I've had to choose where I allocate my time um, with my Hollywood career um, because you got to pay the bills and you got to, you know, eat. <laughs> and um, a lot of times those schedules very much clash with any time you're trying to make plans no more than a month at a time. And the thing about SVP that kind of really makes it tough is the location is always changing. Uh, so sometimes we just can't get to SVP. I think SVP this year was up in Canada. Uh, there was no way we were going to be able to make that. Me personally, though, I would love to have gone into the Tyrell and kind of nosed around. Uh, but no, I mean, I, I'd love to make SVP when I can, but it's not always a thing I can do because my schedules are just constantly uh, changing. <clears throat> sure, yes. Um, uh, I mean, it's. Uh, I was going to say that the Royal Tyrell Museum sounds like a very exciting place to go to and I've uh, personally never had an experience unfortunately to go there but we've just got so much gold to explore as far as the specimens go and yeah. uh, <laughs> so uh, my other um, question then uh, 
since we you mentioned the associations with the museums and the, the tar pits, so let's uh, take them one step at a time. So let's start off with your association with LACM. So uh, would you mind just giving a brief introduction to the viewers of what LACM is and uh, then tell us uh, all of this stuff about it, what sort of things that you find particularly interesting, maybe recommend uh, those who are new, uh, what sort of uh, interesting things you could expect to find there. I was lucky myself uh, in 2014 to have visited LACM and uh, I can probably vouch for anything you will be uh, saying here, but uh, I was uh, <laughs> but I was wondering to hear what your opinion is on this uh, matter, and maybe there was something that I have missed when I was on my trip, which means it's a note, gonna be an extra note in my um, diary for the next time. So, uh, mic microphone over to you, please. Yeah, no, um, LACM, which uh, stands for the Los Angeles uh, County Museum, is better known as NHM, LA, which is Natural History Museum LA. Uh, I, I like to suffix it as NHM, um, and most people in LA are familiar with NHM, um, but NHM is probably the largest paleontological collection of dinosaurs and mammals and invertebrate fossils and amber fossils, uh, I think in all of LA. Um, don't quote me on that, but I've been to other museums. I've been to San Diego. I've been up north to the Science Center in San Francisco. And so far, the newly renovated dinosaur hall alone has more dinosaur specimens on display from around the world than any other location, I believe, here in, L here in California, actually. Not just L.A. County, but California. Um, so, yeah, they have a ton of stuff. They have the Tyrannosaur Growth Series, which is kind of the crown jewel of the dinosaur hall. Uh, they have the giant sauropod, the Memenchosaurus, which got a head swap uh, because that's actually an older mount, I believe, from their original dinosaur hall, and they had the wrong head. Uh, so it was the Apatosaur, uh, Brontosaurus scenario all over again where they got the wrong head. Uh, but there was no need for a name change, I believe, this go-around. Um, so what it was is it's a simple thing of just association, which kind of goes into, like, phylogenic association, which I'm sure is something we'll touch up on. Uh, but when they got the skeleton, it was very much a, a diplodocid, so they, got, they gave it a diplo, diplodocid head, which is a, a family of sauropods. Um, and it was an educational guess. They were absolutely right in making that decision because they just didn't have a head. And it's very common for most sauropods and most fossils to be absent a head. Um, and then they found a head. <laughs> <laughs> and, then they, and then they put the new head in. And, and right under that mount, you will see the old head that they have and the new head that they have on that mount. So that's a cool little detail that you can find right underneath uh, that particular mount. And I think it's the only sauropod skeleton on display. They do have a brachiosaur shoulder somewhere in there. And they do have a, um, I don't know if it's a, a seismosaurus, an argentinosaurus, but it's one of the one of the big vertebrae. And it's, it's, it's like the largest vertebrae in that entire collection. It's, it's a gnarly piece. Um, and then what else do they have? They have a lot of dinosaur eggs. And a lot of dinosaur egg embryos that are found in C2 inside of those eggs. Uh, most of them, I believe, from titanosaurs from uh, Argentina and South America. Um, I believe one of the main curators there in Natural History Museum, uh, Louis Chiappe, um, who is actively uh, the main guy at the Natural History Museum, uh, oversaw a lot of those digs and a lot of those collections. So Louis Chiappe is the, definitely the dinosaur egg guy to go to. Um, they have a Velociraptor, which is kind of the hidden Mickey of the dinosaur uh, hall, because not too many people know there is a Velociraptor. I've even been inside the dinosaur hall and overheard, um, uh, you know, a couple of volunteers that get a rough crash course of the dinosaur hall, but don't figure out all the specimens in the dinosaur hall. And I've heard some of them even tell them, like, oh, we don't have a Velociraptor because they just don't know that they do have a Velociraptor. 
Um, and that's found in the second level uh, going toward the rotunda next to it's hidden behind the bird dinosaur display that they have up there in the second level. Uh, so they do have a skeletal recast of the Mongolian Velociraptor, Velociraptor mongoliensis, I believe it is the, spe the species. And um, I think most people overlook it because they're expecting to see like the giant man-sized Velociraptor, not knowing that Velociraptors were the size of a coyote. So they're very small animals. Um, but yes, we do have a raptor. And then uh, finally... Uh, probably the three most significant things we have in that that particular fossil collection is dinosaur skin. We have a lot of dinosaur skin, mostly from hadrosaurs. And then we have mosasaur skin and a mosasaur soft tissue preservation. So you can see the trachea of the mosasaur, which kind of classified it um, being closer related to varanids, because that was a huge question mark. What where did Mosasaurus come from? Did it come from the lineage of snakes or did it come from the lineage of aquatic reptiles? And if that was it, where and they ended it, they, they were able to kind of uh, hone it down to varanids. Uh, but we do have Mosasaurus skin. And then we have a, um, a I believe the, the animal is a Dolly Kurenkops, uh, but they call it Dolly. And it's a type of pliosaur which is a marine reptile, and it actually has a fossilized baby inside of the skeleton. So that's a live birth um, scenario. That, that's an animal that would give live birth in the ocean that was also a marine uh, reptile. So that's a very rare thing to find, and uh, that's also housed at the Natural History Museum. And that's just the Natural History Museum. I haven't even touched up on the tar pits yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well we'll get it uh, obviously uh, next i mean well, i just wanted to obviously cover the uh, lacm or nhm uh what will you <laughs> uh, first and uh just to uh, go over a few things there i have um i do remember some of the pieces you have mentioned actually i have uh quite a good memory of seeing them and uh, if uh, lucky enough if i you know most of them i believe i've actually taken pictures of but uh, this means that we will have them up on the screen as we were discussing them. If not, then uh, we'll just have to ask the viewers to trust that they are there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think you can even visit the uh, the NHM website, and they're really good about kind of showcasing those particular specimens. I think most of the specimens I mentioned are are kind of highlighted in, on their website. So you should be able to find them with a simple web search and just type NHAM, Mosasaur skin, and something should pop up on your Google image search. There is this um, interesting, I, I'm pretty sure you know which one I'm talking about. It's probably a cast of uh, the specimens that are featured in the main dinosaur hall. They are um, basically the mount of a T-Rex uh, dueling a Triceratops. It's basically as you enter the museum, they, I don't know uh, how long ago have you been in, to the museum, but uh, in 2014 they had it mounted there. So as I was entering the museum and uh, got my tickets and everything, then uh, the next thing I would see uh, behind these, uh, you know, entry points was this uh, mount uh, right in the center of the big hall. Yeah, no, um, that... It is called the dueling dinos. There's a lot of dueling dinos. Uh, so you have the Montana dueling dinos, which is the one tied up in auction with uh, Bloody Jane. And then you have the Mongolian dueling dinos, which is the Velociraptor fighting the Protoceratops. And then L.A. has their dueling dinos. Uh, so I have to specify that we're talking about L.A.'s dueling dinos. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yes, that, that is the T-Rex and the Triceratops. And there's a bronze mount of it. Um, on the main street that's adjacent to Metrolink. Um, so that is that specimen that that bronze sculpture is designed after. And that, that mount did not happen till I want to say, sometime around 2006, maybe 2007. Um, before that mount, there was a mount of a Camptosaurus and a Allosaurus that was being uh, that were fighting in the middle of that that same space, and that was there for years. And it's actually you can even find it in a couple of movies 
of all the movies that I found that mountain, though, uh, one of the mount, one of the movies to note is, um, I think it's a uh, Cyborg Two with Angelina Jolie, and there's a whole scene where they go into a random science museum, and lo and behold. It's the Natural History Museum of L.A., and you can see the Allosaurus and the Camptosaurus mount there. So there's a bit of uh, movie trivia for you guys if you want to look up that particular mount in a movie. Uh, Cyborg 2, of all things, has the original L.A. Museum mount of the dueling di- their original dueling dinos. But, uh, but yeah, no, that mount is significant. Um, the head on that mount, I believe, is Harley. And uh, Harley is a skull that was discovered a while ago, and it was it was for the longest time the crown jewel of the Natural History Museum because I think it was the only piece of Tyrannosaur that they had for a while um, was just that skull. And then they found a skeleton, I want to say, in the 90s, and they put Harley's skull on that skeleton, and that may ended up being the um, the dueling dinosaurs that we see. And then it was funny enough, because a lot of stuff was being learned at the time, even with that skeletal mount, they had to fill in the gaps. And I believe Sue, when she first got discovered, she made a world tour, and Sue ended up at the Natural History Museum, I want to say again in 2006, 2007, um, rough dates. And the Natural History Museum was able to cross-reference Sue with their new Tyrannosaur mount, and ended up discovering that the arms on that Tyrannosaur mount that they just put up in the rotunda uh, were actually too big because of the cross-references they were able to make with Sue. So they found Sue's arms, and then they compared them to Harley's new body, and they were kind of like, oh, wait, these arms are too big. And it was funny because the Natural History Museum actually, uh, they're very transparent with these finds, which is what I love with the museum. They even had cue cards on display while Harley was in the... Uh, while Harley was on display, saying, hey, go check out Harley, and then go check out our T-Rex, and the arms are too big. (laughs) (laughs) And um, I was in high school at the time, so yeah, because of the transparency with the Natural History Museum um, and their their goals toward education or re-education, that was the only reason why I even knew that fact. It was because they were so open about education. I recall there was a really massive collection of... um you know, uh, rocks and minerals, uh, I believe it's, oh my god, is it in the basement floor or was it on a different, I can't remember where exactly it was, but it was really cool, like there was so much, so many like uh, things related to Gold Rush, I believe as well, uh, correct me if I'm Yeah, wrong. yeah, um, that's, that's the mineral hall, and it's one of a lot of um, big displays that they have in the Natural History Museum, uh, but the mineral hall is on the first floor so as soon as you enter the museum uh go to one of the four corners of the museum and you'll find the mineral hall and the way you find the mineral hall is they literally have right outside the door giant slabs of gypsum and crystal and pyrite uh just chilling in a display case and you go in and one of the first displays you hit is the gold rush display where they have all the gold uh kind of on display heavily guarded if anybody gets any ideas. <laughs> um, and then as soon as you pass the gold, uh, there is a bunch of uh, mineral samples that you see of various uh, concoctions and even some meteorite samples. And then way in the back, they have the gem vault, again, heavily guarded, um, big, giant, three-foot-thick steel door. And currently right now, I think they have what's known as the green diamonds on display which are really cool because the green diamonds are diamonds that were irradiated with gamma radiation uh, through natural processes, which is how they get their green hue. Um, So those are currently on display. The last time I was in the gem hall, they had what was known as the red diamond. Uh, So I was able to see the red diamond. I'll probably go back to see the green diamonds. Uh, But yeah, the, 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 um, the mineral hall and the gem vault always have kind of a circulating display um uh touch and go they're they're always kind of changing up the the displays and the special exhibits because there is so much that they have on exhibit that's kind of hidden uh hold on real quick cameo um i think my clock is going (laughs) off so there's some there's some audio um there's a little bit of of music background here yeah yeah that's that's the clock that's my that's one hour 
It goes off every hour, so we'll know exactly when an hour has passed. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's still going. I'll, I'll let you know. Come on. We're almost there. Come on. There we go. All right. So um, if uh, I, I suppose that pretty much covers our um, part with, with regards to the museum. And uh, once again, we'll mention that I was lucky enough to uh, visit the museum when I was uh, in uh, Los Angeles in 2014. And uh, I absolutely enjoyed it. I would say I definitely recommend everybody on this channel who whenever if you are not from Los Angeles, and when you do vi visit the city, then absolutely have to go there. If you are into paleontology, then it's a must, you know, go to place. And uh, now let's move on to the tar pits, which I unfortunately did not get time to visit uh, next time I want to. So let's uh, let's talk about tar pits because I will be a new listener to that part as I've never seen them personally. So Josh, what is the deal with the tar pits? <laughs> so so the tar pits are um they're a natural formation they're a natural geological formation which is a pit trap um that extended into the ice age um and is still currently active today uh which makes it i believe the longest geological pit trap to exist in the world it's also the longest ongoing excavation in paleontology in the world um we they began digging up fossils in the tar pits i believe in the early 1900s and they are still digging up new fossils from the tar pits as we speak um, and the current project they have over there is um, they're kind of wrapping up that project, but it was a bunch of crates that they found filled with fossils when they were building a new parking lot. And so because L.A. is finicky about their construction, they, they could not halt the construction. They were like, OK, get these bones out of here. We got to do our construction. Typical L.A. Uh, so they boxed up all of the fossils in these giant crates and they ship them onto an on-site location further into the tar pits um, park. And they put them on display for people to see fenced off. So people were actively working on these uh, fossil crates to see what exactly was being found. And along with those fossils, they found, I think, the largest or actually the biggest Colombian mammoth to date. Uh, whose name is Zed. So he's the largest Colombian mammoth in the tar pits. Um, I think the numbers are roughly 10, maybe 10 to 20% larger than their standard Colombian mammoth. Um, so if you go to the tar pits, you can see pieces of Zed kind of scattered about on display and being worked on in the fishbowl lab, uh, which is the big lab that you see. You can actually observe actual paleontologists and uh, volunteers uh, sorting through microfossils and plaster jacketing. And at, the, at one point they had Zed's head in there being worked on. And uh, there's pics of me with Zed's head if you want to cue those up. So the, the pics of me with the mammoth skull in the Fishbowl Museum, that is Zed's uh, head, uh, which they found. I think Zed's head is the first thing they found, which kind of halted construction got the tar pits people over and, and they kind of looked at it and said, oh, hey, yeah, this is a giant mammoth. Uh, let's try to get this out of here. And um, yeah, the tar pits is a wild place. There's there's a lot of uh, fauna and flora that are found. Um, there's mammoth, there's mastodon, there's short-faced bear, there's smilodon fatalis, which is the, the famous saber cat. Uh, there's uh, Panthera atrox, formerly Felis atrox, which is the American lion. Uh, there's the Teratorn, which is a giant um, a vulture-like animal. Uh, there is, they actually find the ancestors of California condor, coyotes, red-tailed hawk, um, eagles, uh, eagles as big as the golden eagle that you find in Africa. Um, there's ground sloth. There's a, a couple of species of ground sloth, including Shasta's ground sloth and Harlan's ground sloth. 
uh, there's camel, there's horses, uh, there, <laughs> the list goes on and on, really. <laughs> and uh, all of this is on display at the tar pits, um, including bison. Uh, we also have our bison. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it sounds like a very impressive list, and I also couldn't help but noticing that uh, pretty much, well, uh, with maybe a few exceptions, you know, that some animals may have been from the same or very close uh, proximity as far as their periods go, but uh, I noticed that quite a lot of animals you've listed are from different periods, which is very interesting as well, because you've said that it's been around for, since, like, well, not forever, but for quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, people that know the geological state of the Ice Age. Um, so basically, it's it's during the... Um, we're going to keep digging deeper. So as you dig deeper, um, you, you'll probably find things older and older. Uh, again, the tar pits are an ongoing excavation. Uh, so we're barely scratching the surface in a lot of instances with a lot of the pits. Uh, the biggest pit we have is Pit 91, which has been the longest ongoing excavation pit um, at the tar pits. So uh, currently all of the paleontologists and excavators have been working on the crates that came out of this construction site. And as that wraps up, they will probably uh, shift gears and go back to Pit 91 which is where they normally are. They normally are at pit 91 digging up more and more bones. Um, in fact, if you go to pit 91, which is one of the biggest observation pits, I think they have like pieces of a sloth, uh, a dire wolf, um, a saber cat, I think a horse just jutting out of the mud because there, it is just that compacted, full of bones. And, and everything you see at the tar pits... Uh, that's on display, those are bones that are actively excavated at the tar pits. So you don't see anything at the tar pits that wasn't found at the tar pits. Uh, everything you see, including the wall of wolf skulls, are all fossils that were located at those tar pits and dug out of a physical tar pit. So, yeah, in other words, basically, this <clears throat> whole um, collection does not, not only does it not, uh, you know, export fossils I, pre I presume right but you know, everything basically stays there but nothing also comes in there it's actually a similar concept uh, to a museum here in central london called the wallace collection it's a different theme obviously it's more of a historical like medieval renaissance but the principle is very similar that uh, the collection is based in this specific site it's very kind of you know uh, uh, site related collection so to speak specifically yeah, it's um, it's done kind of to keep from um, uh, it's a concept of like collection contamination. Uh, so you want to make they're basically they're, they're making the largest collection of paleontological samples that are not contaminated by an outside collection. In terms of they they if you go to the tar pits, you know you're going to get a data set for a study or an abstract solely on uh specimens that are from the tar pits you're not going to get any cross contamination of a mastodon from like simi valley uh which is on display at the natural history museum but it, those aren't going to be confused with the mastodon that are discovered at the tar pits so you're going to get tar pits mastodon um, and you're going to get tar pits mammoth and you're going to get tar pits uh saber cats uh, which kind of make it a very unique data set for people that do their research and do their abstracts or do their master thesis. Cool. Yeah, it's interesting. I really need to go back to Los Angeles now. I, I'm well. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I mean, I'm now I'm properly tempted, and I I'm dying to go there now. So, so it's cool. yeah, no, it's it's cool. There's one thing. There's another hidden Mickey. I'm all about the hidden Mickey's at museums. Um, during the 80s, and I want to say into the 90s, they had something called the La Brea Woman, uh, which was a skull of a, of a woman that they found in the tar pits. And they actually had this kind of mirror display of this La Brea Woman, and it was removed after a while. And funny enough, the only place now we can find a resin casting of that skull that they found at the tar pits is at the museum in Santa Barbara. I ran into it accidentally. 
because they have fossil castings of the tar pit specimens. And sure enough, one of the <laughs> fossil castings is, uh, sorry, there, there, there's people around me just kind of waving. <laughs> but um, basically, uh, one of the castings that they have at Santa Barbara is of the La Brea woman. So if you want to find a casting of the skull from La Brea woman, you can find it at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. Awesome. <clears throat> Well, uh, that's uh, very informative. I mean, I've learned quite a lot of interesting and, uh, you know, just exciting stuff from uh, the tar pits uh, because, like I said already, I haven't been there myself and I'm absolutely dying to visit it now that I know what to expect to look for because um, when I actually visited the Los Angeles um, uh, Natural History Museum, my only real awareness of the specimens that were there were the uh, T-Rex growth series, because that's what I mainly heard of, and that's what I associated the museum with as I was uh, planning my trip and my pit stops. So uh, I didn't realize that there were quite a few other interesting things, which, I, I mean, obviously it's been quite a few years and I have to look through my photos, so whatever I can dig up, I will put it on a screen as well in relation to the specimens you mentioned. But um, come to think of it, I now kind of wish I would have paid more attention to these little details so I could remember them right now so we can, so I could have brought something up as well in case I noticed something in particularly interesting. So Yeah, no, it's um, the, the, La Brea, the La Brea Tar Pits and the Natural History Museum, they take multiple trips to kind of get everything. Um, even if you even if you kind of focus on one particular field, so if, if you were to focus on just geology, for example, and you visit the mineral hall, there's no way you're going to be able to go through the entire collection in one sitting or in one visitation because there's just so many samples that are just up on display, and they're they're not even hidden really. It's just they're so compacted and there's so much that your mind just gets over oversaturated you don't know all the data you're taking in until after the fact and then you look through like the thousands of photos you took and you're like oh hey there was another meteorite and oh hey this is this is possibly from the Tung tunguska blast and all this other stuff uh same with the paleontology uh because there's two paleo large paleontological halls there's the mammal hall which is a lot of the cenozoic specimens and then there's the dinosaur hall which encapsulates a lot of the uh, Mesozoic specimens, and even in the T-Rex growth series, when I first saw it, the first thing you you zo zone into is the mounted skeletons because they're just right there, uh, smack dab in the middle of the floor, and, and you just can't help but stare at them for like a good two hours. Um, but as you start exploring more of those specimens, you start seeing that it's one of the rare cases where the Natural History Museum actually has the skull fragments that make up all three growth series uh, T-Rexes on display. So you'll see the T-Rex specimen from the Jordan theropod, which I believe makes the youngest of the, the three T-Rexes, and then the adolescent theropod uh, or Tyrannosaur. And then you see Thomas, uh, which is the largest of the Tyrannosaurs that are in that growth series. And even then, when you see the fragments of Thomas, you go to the second level and you realize that, again, something you can miss, but Thomas has a possible pathology uh, right under the orbital process, I think right there on the jugal, uh, which is an indentation where they think that Thomas suffered from a, a tumor or cancerous growth. So there's a lot of valuable information there because shy of Thomas, I never really got a, um, I never really got a active, um, sample of that kind of pathology on a tyrannosaur. Uh, like I didn't know tyrannosaurs. I, I, I imagine they suffered from a lot of diseases and we have a lot of papers on various diseases, but I didn't think tyrannosaurs suffered from, you know, face cancer, which Thomas did. So that's already a new, uh, type of data that as an amateur paleontologist, you can visit the Natural History Museum and you're just bombarded with constant amounts of information. Yeah, this is really like, uh, I, I can imagine that information, especially for those who actually know what to look for, like not just a casual viewer who just looks at things that look pretty, but uh, like for 
somebody who actually tries to dig into it and uh, get as much out of it as possible, you would probably need to spend good three days or more in there. And as in like three days, meaning uh, at least one day dedicated per each hall that you want to study rather than just, uh, you know, um, visiting everything and just like quickly round tripping and spamming this photograph button everywhere. Because that's kind of similar to what I did. I only stayed focused on a few specimens, but I wanted to quickly go around because my time was limited. So I was uh, quickly trying to take pictures of as much as I could literally get uh, into a good quality shot. <laughs> that's basically what yeah. I was doing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it, I mean, the, the, those two museums here in L.A., I tell people, if you visit any museum L in L.A. Um, or Los Angeles... Those are the two museums to visit, are the Tar Pits and the Natural History Museum. And they kind of cross-intersect, too, because um, the Natural History Museum has a lot of actual um, fossils from the Tar Pits on display because they're sister museums. They're, they're all part of kind of the same museum chain. And the Natural History Museum in their Mammal Hall, I think, has one of the largest short-faced bear skulls I've ever seen and it came from the tar pits and I, I want to say that skull and it's hard to say because the, the tar pits has a short face bear mount on display and their short face bear mount is high up next to their horse so you're seeing that you had a bear that was as tall as a horse and both of these animals are kind of taller than the mastodon mount that you see when you enter it um, but then you go to the Mammal Hall in the Natural History Museum and you see their short face bear skull and they all came from the same formation, the tar pits. And I want to say it's even bigger. So you're, you're getting a bigger skull at a different museum from the same data set that's being set by the tar pits. Yeah, that <clears throat> would mean we would probably be encountering quite a large animal and big bear. Yeah, no, I tell people it, it's a bear sized uh, and not a bear. <laughs> it's a it's a, a mammoth sized bear. That's the best way I can kind of describe it to people. I, I tell people the the American lion was a bear sized lion, and the short faced bear was a mastodon sized bear, um, and that gets people's imaginations going very fast as far as like, well, how big is the animal? And you're like, oh, it's this big, and they're like, wow, that's big. <laughs> and you're just like, yes. Yes, it is. That that was a true monster during the Ice Age. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, also, uh, as we were preparing for this session, um, you have mentioned that uh, you can share some information with us about the uh, Foothill Mammoth digs, uh, Josh, is that correct? Yes, yes. No, that's, that's probably one of the... Um, it was one of the first... Um, digs that I got involved with um, via the tar pits. So uh, one of the head or lead lab technicians at the tar pits, Trevor Valley, um, invited me up to Northern California uh, to dig up a new mammoth that these farmers had found, which is a very common story. Uh, farmers finding mammoths or passerbyers finding mammoths. We actually do have a lot of Colombian mammoths here in uh, Los Angeles and in California. So we end up heading up to Northern California, and the group that was leading the dig was the, the Foothill College. So um, Foothill is the, is the um, institute that is currently housing all of these fossils. And we went there expecting, like, a mammoth. And when we got there, we ended up with an entire farm field of just fossils. So the mammoth was kind of the the first big animal it's probably the largest most complete specimen that we recovered from that farm uh, but the um, the additional fauna that was found out there uh, was extensive and it was broken up into three sites it was site a site b and site c site a is where the mammoth is uh, site b is a site called bruce willis hill and it was because the only way to access the fossils was traversing this hill uh, so you get this very, um, like, Tomb Raider moment with me where they just tell, and none of us brought repel gear to repel down the side of this cliff. 
So the only other option for me was how do we get the fossils? And I'm like, all right, stand back, guys. And I grab two um, work knives and I just start knifing my way up the hill like something you see out of like just an action movie. And then people had dubbed the hill Bruce Willis Hill after that <laughs> because of my because of my fossil recovery shenanigans. Um, but yeah, at Bruce Willis Hill or Site B, we found, um, again, a prehistoric horse. Uh, we found camel. Uh, we were on a break. And then over Easter that year sometime, uh, somebody found a mastodon tooth. So we ended up going back to Site B. We recovered more mastodon teeth, mastodon tooth buds, cranial process, um, a lot of fragmentary bits. Uh, we recovered uh, some even microfossil data, so we recovered some mouse brain casings and whatnot. Um, so, and then we went back to Site C, uh, which is right next to Site A, which is where the mammoth was found. And we dubbed that Insectivore City. And the reason was because we found a lot of microfossils. Uh, so we have found a lot of insectivores like mice and gerbils and, and lemmings and even some bird uh, fauna. And then, ironically, on Site C, further down, um, we found a megalonyx Jeffersoni uh, carpal bone, which, and it was just chilling right there on the surface. We didn't even have to dig for it. And that, that carpal bone is one of my first fossils excavated out of that particular site. So I actually got to dig up the, the megalonyx Jeffersoni. And then later on, I was digging up the rest of the mastodon. And then later on, we were recovering more and more. So, so we got a lot of animals that came out of, cat, uh, out of the, the uh, foothill of fossil site. And then the interesting thing about that fossil site, because there's still a lot that's yet to be recovered, is we found a lot of big herbivores. So we, we find mastodon, we find mammoth, uh, we find camel, we find horse, we find bison, we find ground sloth. But we have yet to find any apex predators. So we have not found any big predators which is strange because we have what is initially like a carnivore buffet of very large herbivores with no carnivores to really kind of uh, capitalize on why there's so... We don't know that there's a big mystery why there's so many herbivores and no carnivores at this site. Yeah, that's a very interesting question indeed. I mean, um, to be fair, uh, like prey and predators they always go uh, hand to hand with each other and uh, I think you it's safe to predict at least and I believe that would probably be an expectation of many uh, people who are still digging in the sites uh, to find some of these predators yeah there, there's um because uh, like just my personal experience with the dig um, it was ongoing for a couple of years uh, we recovered as much of the fossils as we could, per the permission of the farm owners, uh, which is one of the one of the issues that we run into when you find fossil sites on private land. We're kind of at the mercy of the privateers or the people that own that land. Uh, so they were very generous. Uh, they let us dig there for a while. <laughs> um, they let us recover everything that we could on the surface without being too abrasive with the digging methods. Um, but that was the ongoing bet was what predator were we going to find because there was, it made no sense. Like we should be seeing wolf, uh, we should be seeing at least some kind of bear, um, maybe a saber cat or two. And that, that was it. We, we didn't find anything, um, even remotely up to the task of taking down an animal like a mammoth. So there, there's a very interesting dynamic that's going on with that fossil dig. And um, I think we're still in talks with the farm owners. We're trying to figure out how to go about it. Um, I'm in contact with one of the main guys up there, which is uh, Professor Tim King, uh, who works out of the Foothill uh, College. And he's the guy that kind of set everything in motion and got us up from L.A. And me and Tim talk forever. And um, Tim 
has been in contact and we've just been trying to figure out when's the next chance we're going to get back onto that site to dig up and find that mystery predator uh, whatever predator it is going to be that's going to end up in this formation and then along with that dig I mean our, our mammoth hunting didn't end there um, right after that dig we got invited to talk on the this whole site at Stanford so Stanford University we gave a lecture on mammoth and then Tim and me uh, while we were there on the lecture hall on the on the campus we get presented with another mammoth tooth and we look at this mammoth tooth and we're like where did this come kind stranger and we ended up finding yet another mammoth on location uh, along the shoreline that was exposed due to a landslide so that that's the photo of the two gents you see kneeling down with all those mammoth bits those are from another mammoth in southern california no actually northern california uh closer to san francisco so me and tim were hunting mammoth for a good couple of years uh getting them a, um a consolidated getting them to the appropriate museums making sure a lot of these specimens didn't get lost to private collectors or just end up on ebay um, both of those specimens are safely in the hands of actual either educational institutions or museum institutions. Um, and then Tim um, would later go on and do a special of Mammoth uh, for National Geographic. So I was sadly not available at the time because of Hollywood. Um, but yeah, I mean, he would send me even more pictures of like tons of soft tissue preservation that they have at, I believe the St. Petersburg museum in, uh, in Russia. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, we've, we've actively become like the mammoth guys for a good couple of years. Um, just between our experience, just going oath all through California, getting mammoth and consolidating mammoth and, and for me, um, illustrating mammoth and drawing the mammoth and so much mammoth. <laughs> That's a lot of mammoth, yeah. <laughs> so much mammoth. <laughs> so, uh, well, yes, I mean, um, I'm interested in particular to find out what sort of mystery predator or perhaps predators, plural, we might discover there. So... Keep us up to date with that information. Hopefully, if you do get to come back to the site, or if we, or if you just find out from uh, your uh, digging colleagues who you've been there with last time, so that we can obviously, you know, keep up to date and uh, get all this stuff posted up here on the channel later on once we get enough data to share, and uh, this will be worthy of making new content. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just uh, the the next interview will be like we found the predator, and and we'll we'll do the big reveal of whatever it is. <laughs> that would be amazing. Actually, it would it would just actually come out as a perfect script for the next installment for the next session when you get to come back. So that would be very very convenient. Okay. Uh, well. Uh, this is really interesting, and uh, I am uh, certainly very uh, glad so many interesting subjects have been brought up uh, throughout this just first part of the session, which means that the first part has come to an end now. However, that is definitely not the only part, because I did say it's a first and there's gonna be more to follow. So please stay tuned, and uh, part two will resume anytime soon, as soon as I finish editing. So, uh, round of applause. <laughs> round of applause for Malcolm Josh and round of applause for AK Rex for taking all of this craziness uh, during the session. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. We will see you shortly.